Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on the fifth and final Archives 101 session today. Our gracious leader, Amherst Williams, is under the weather. So Emily and Diane and I will be steering the ship this morning. Um, so great to have you. Wonderful to see so many people. I think you're going to love today's presentation by Diane. Um, just as a reminder, we are here and thanking the National Historical Publications and Records Commission, otherwise known as NHPRC, for providing funding for this collaborative grant between the League and Conservation Connection, which is the hat I wear. I'm Kathy Cargo-Barda, the Director of Conservation Connection. Um, and we are just a couple of things of business before we get on to Diane's presentation. Um, Google Classroom is going to be up and running past this time. You can go into that at any point. It doesn't shut down. It doesn't turn off. So that's always available to use any of those resources. Um, after today's class, as usual, Emily and I will post the recording of this class to Google Classroom, as well as the League's YouTube channel, any other additional resources, and the evaluation for today's program. If you haven't had a chance, um, we really, really want your evaluations for all five programs. So please be sure to go to Cl Google Classroom. The links are right there. There's simply a, a Google form, not very long, but it really helps us know what worked for you, what more you want to know, and um, help us really fine tune our programs as we deliver them to you via Zoom and in person. So without any more delay, let me introduce you to Diane Lee, which I'm sure so many of you know. Uh, she's the project coordinator for the League's Connecticut Collections Group and also the collections manager at the Fairfield Museum in Fairfield, Connecticut. She has been working with the Collective Access Platform since 2016, so is well-versed in its capabilities and assisting members with training and questions. And primarily focused on objects, Diane has been working more closely with the archival collections component of Connecticut Collections in Reading Fairfield's archives for public access above and beyond their existing paper finding aims. Her goal in this um, Archives 101 series is to help groups feel confident in planning on working with their archival collections and that everyone has access to archives training and support to learn best practices and enable them to organize and share their collections. So without further ado, Diane, please take it away. Thank you, Kathy. You pretty much said everything I was going to say in my introduction. So that's awesome. Um, Sorry. I'm going to do, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, okay. Seeing my full screen with my URL, but it's going to make it easier for me in the end to be able to see some of my slides. So um, we're going to take a step back a little bit this morning from what we've all been talking about with the really deep dives into how to process your archives and all the nuts and bolts of it. We're going to kind of take a step back and look at everything that we've been learning and how we're going to put all that stuff together. Um, so about me, um, Kathy covered a big part of it. Um, I'm a museum person. This is not me, but I basically, you can find me doing this quite a bit um, in the picture. Um, I use the archives quite a bit, uh, and I work with my colleagues pretty closely. Uh, this also means I'm coming to this with the same background as a lot of you guys are from this kind of the overall general museum um, background and more of the object stuff background a lot of the time. Um, I've maybe used finding aids in passing in the past just to kind of um, do some research on stuff or find out more information about my collections. Um, however, the past few months, my museum has been without an archivist so or a librarian. So I have been faux librarian reference desk person for the last several months, um, which has been really interesting. It's given me a lot closer view of the archives and learning to use them and how to find things without like really knowing the collection. Like I knew surface level of the collection, some of the highlight things that we needed to know, but I've really more started having to go in and search for things um, to see how easy it was to use, like what was what was available. Um, 
Our archivists have gone over a lot in the sessions and they've had some fantastic information. Um, sometimes overwhelming, I will say myself, um, having shared office space with archivists and dealt with them a lot and been nosy about a lot of this and wanting to know more. I even found it a little overwhelming at parts. I'm like, I'm going to have to come back and watch this again and look at my notes because yikes. Um, so I'm going to kind of look at the overall thought process about how do we tackle this now, now that we have all these tools. And I don't know why my little, that wasn't working. There we go. So after all this, we're still left with piles of this that we're staring in at our archives. Um, you've been learning about the tools. And even if you've already had experience, you're probably hopefully picking up some um, tips along the way from the speakers. So now we're actually digging into the work. You walk into your archives, you look and you see piles like this. Um, so how do you get started to make those lovely finding aids that Brian's been showing us and the things that you see on, on uh, Connecticut Archives Online? Um, the first thing to do, like rather than just start digging in, make a plan. Um, make a plan before you really are delving into all of this stuff. You may really want to say, now I have all the knowledge. We're ready. We can go. We can really get going on all of this stuff. Um, but stop before you go too, too far. Um, you don't want to overwhelm yourselves to the point of sabotaging yourselves before you start. You don't want to have one person starting that big, horrible pile of stuff. Somebody else is working on something different. Miscommunication happens all the time. You don't want to take on too much by saying, I'm just going to deal with this whole entire pile of stuff. Um, come up with a plan. You don't have to go through every single one of those little pieces of paper. Um, in fact, don't do that. Um, start looking at the very basic level. Um, this is what you really want to do to let people know you have those collections. Uh, you don't have to go through all of the forms. There's when you look both at Connecticut collections and um, archive, not archive, yeah, archive space. Um, there's a ton of fields, and I always tell everybody with a lot of stuff, you don't have to fill out all of them. Um, a couple of things, there are required fields that you really need to fill out. That's fine, but they're usually pretty simple. Like what's your catalog number? What's your accession number? That kind of thing. Um, don't feel like you have to know all that information right now. It's the beauty of computers is that you, you're not carving anything in stone. You can go back in and fill in the information as you get it. Um, and if you're taking too much time to try to find all that out right this second, you're not going to get through your entire backlog. You're still going to end up walking into your storage and seeing that pile of stuff that still needs to be um, gone through. Um, one of the terms, and I don't know that anybody said it in any of these sessions, and I so again, coming from the museum world, the archivist can correct me and, and give me updates on things too. One thing I don't think I heard anybody say that I learned when working with my archivist colleagues, more product, less process. Um, they really, when I worked with them years ago, they were working on a grant and they had to get a certain amount of things done in a certain amount of time. So really going through and spending a ton of detail and time on all of this stuff was really not practical. They were working on a backlog. I don't remember how long the grant was for, it was at least two years, probably more. Um, they needed the basic overview. They needed to go a little bit farther and create like a box folder level. Um, thing, but they couldn't take the time to really delve into a lot of this. Um, there's a good definition here from the Society of American Archivists um, talking about what this kind of means. Um, you're just going through and getting the overview. Um, use your judgment on this with some of your collections. It's a really good guiding um, thought process, but use your judgment on a lot of this stuff because you do know your collections. Um, you know your history of your town, your area, your um, institution, and you know what's going to be a little bit more familiar, what's going to be more um, in demand than, than some things. So 
one of the things that really stood out to me in this was, um, you know, minimal description, original physical arrangement, including keeping newspapers and clippings in situ. I will put an asterisk in that and just say that again, use your judgment. Um, how likely is it that you're going to get back to this collection to kind of rehouse some of this stuff? So some things like that for the safety of the overall archival collection or the safety of those individual objects, you might want to deal with that stuff as you go. And you can deal with things like pulling paper clips and things off and replacing them with plastic and that um, to really look out for the archival part of this. Um, but in general, it's a really good guiding principle as you're going through this and as you're making your plan. Our goals with this whole session, this whole webinar series are uh, findability and accessibility, creating finding aids that will help you and help others be guided to your collections. And I know like at the beginning, and I've heard several people say, like, kind of look at me funny. If I say finding, it's like, what are you talking about? I don't know what that is. By now, hopefully you all know what that is. Um, but a good way to explain it to people is to think of it as the table of contents for the collection. If you're looking at a book, you're going to look at the table of contents and the kind of description on the back cover to see what it's about. If you want to delve into it or not, you look at the description. Oh, okay. This sounds really interesting. Maybe especially a history book, you're going to look at the table of contents and be like, oh, oh, okay, yeah, I do want to know this stuff. So it's a good way to look at this too, figuring out it's it's this is the kind of guide to the overall collection. Um, I find it's a good way to describe it to researchers when they come in, because those are mostly the people um, that are, you know, the amateur genealogist that's coming in. I'm like, let me give you this finding aid. And they're like, what? I don't know what that is. Um, so this is the kind of thing that's helpful even on this level is just this basic, what is this called? What is the physical description? Um, and I think it was either um, Brian or Leith mentioned, you know, just the, even the repository level information is interesting to know that um, the Fairfield Museum has Fairfield Cemetery Association research or records. Um, we also have Roger Minot Sherman papers. Um, these are more fleshed out so when you go down, you can see them, but it's, you know, something that it's good just to let people know that they're here. So as we're getting done with this whole webinar series and session, go back and watch everything again. Um, this will help you make more sense of it as you work through this. Um, the I even, I watched the first series through and as I was getting ready for this, I watched them again and I was still picking things up and take notes for yourselves to go back and see which sessions you want to reference and which um, resources. There's some amazing resources that everybody's added. Um, I did add a resource page to the class, to the Google Classroom um, of a couple of interesting things that I found while I was going through prepping for this. So there's a couple links there for you for that as well. But never hesitate to go back and watch this and reference those and email some of the archivists um, to get some information. So as you're getting into it, you're, okay, you've got this all straight. You're kind of really thinking about what needs to be done. Again, before you jump in, you need a plan, a guide, and a workflow. We want to get from that hectic picture on the left to the beautiful, lovely, sorted picture on the right. Um, we assume all the things on the right have lovely finding aids and they're archived properly and housed archivally and everything's wonderful. Um, but we want to get there from one to the other. Um, you may not get there yet. You may not get there all at once. So this is why we need to plan this out. Um, like I've said, collection level finding aid is fine at this stage um, and you can fill things on you as fill things in as you go. Um, and like Martha covered in session one, as you're deciding what collections that you want to tackle, um, make a list, just of a rough overview. You know, over in the collection, we have the John Smith papers in the corner. We have the Mary Smith papers in the corner. Which one's more of interest? Which one's something that you're going to want to tackle? Um, 
don't tackle that 50 bankers box collection, maybe one bankers box, maybe one little stack of letters. Start with some of that as you create the workflow, get your, um, your staff, your volunteers, everybody kind of used to how you want to get things done. Um, and as you go, you can figure out what's going to work best for your institution. Um, the one thing you really would like to do is create a guide for yourselves too. So this is going to be your in-house internal cheat sheet on how you're going to do the work. It's going to, you know, follow best practices, but, um, frequent questions that might be asked by people. And it's not something that's necessarily going to be covered in the archivists um, lessons and plans and things. Cause we're talking now more about how things are assigned numbers at your institution, which they spoke of in the sessions, but you guys need to decide and write down what's gonna work for you. Are you gonna use that MS? What number are you starting with if you haven't had a number and an assigned thing yet? Um, write that down so that next year, say something comes up, we get COVID again and everything gets locked down again. We have to pick this up later on down the road where were you? What were you? Um, what were you doing to make sure everything stays um, standardized? So, how are things assigned to numbers? Were you recording the numbers on the boxes, on the folders? And I think Adrian had a question about that last week. Like, how is there a standardized thing? There may not be a standardized guide in the overall grand world, but figure that out for your institution. Figure out that the you know, the folder number goes in the right-hand side. The collection number goes on the left-hand side. It's written in pencil. It's printed and not writing. It's all really little detail things that sound silly until you go in and try to work through um, a box of materials that didn't follow that. And it's really um, kind of disconcerting. You're like, oh, I'm looking for this in the wrong place. I need to know where this is. Um, things like how the collection's named. I didn't want to go that far how the collection's named. Um, what are the steps in the processing? When you're tackling that big, giant, mucky pile of stuff in that other picture, you know, what are you doing? Are you untying it? Are you looking at it? Are you putting it into piles? Um, this is something that, you know, the archivist can help you out with a workflow. Um, we're hopefully going to be doing a hands-on archival session. Um, look for your emails for that for any Connecticut Collections members um, that that's open and available to you. But this is something that um, the archivist can help you out with guides, things, um, even your neighbor institutions. Um, a lot of places that are around that have existing uh, giant archival collections and professional staff and all that, they can help you um, give you some ideas and like go over and see, you have a bigger institution nearby, call them up and ask them, be like, hey, I need some ideas. I want to see how you guys do things. Um, like they said, I think it was Lee said in, in the things, look at their finding aids too. See how they're starting out and how they're sorting some of this. Um, figure out what works best for you and come up with a concrete work plan. Um, I, <laughs> I invented a new word. We're going with work documentation. So it's similar to workflow. You're gonna document what your workflow is gonna be and establish what that workflow is gonna be. Um, one of the things I've been a, a fan of over the years with, um, with colleagues, with interns, with volunteers is projects that can be picked up and put down. Um, the dean, you know, I don't have to say the danger with this. You know, it's nice if you have one person working on one collection, um, because they're going to have that overview themselves of how they're going to put this in. But I don't know how many of how practical that is for everybody, um, because a lot of folks are going to have either volunteers that only have a few hours a week that the building's open that they can go in and work on, or even professional staff. You're always going to get called away to do something else. Um, you're going to get called away to help somebody with an exhibit install, or maybe the um, dosing didn't show up today. So someone gets called away to help with a school group. Um, so you're never going to have that Monday through Friday, nine to five, all the time in the world that you want to be able to go through this. Um, so being able to have something that you can go through and say, okay, this is our workflow. This is how we've established our guide and our plan. So now I know how to document this. Um, the keys 
good communication with the rest of your um, staff and your volunteers and everyone. Um, leave notes, take notes as you're going through the collection. Um, mark down things like this collection needs to be completely physically rehoused. Um, take notes on what kind of things you're finding. The session on um, archival storage was fantastic. And this is something that um, you can figure out what supplies you need as you're going through and working on the collection and taking your notes and adding things in. Make that part of your workflow to note that for people and to say, um, you know, this is where we need, um, we, ha we have five archival boxes. Wow, we really needed more. We need different folders. We need more folders. We're running out. We need, um, there's a ton of photographs in this. Um, we need more sleeves for this. You know, it's things that you want to make sure that is part of your standard arts day of going through this information. Um, oh, and the other thing I was thinking too is, you know, you can assign people to certain collections so you do have that run on knowledge. Maybe have a couple people working on this. Maybe have teams that you can go on so you're not losing that, um, you know, capacity of somebody knowing what they're working on when they when it gets time to do the record and to figure out what they need to do. Um, and I'll say it again because I underlined it, so I will say it again. Have the person document where they left off for the day. Doesn't have to be an essay. You can put it as a post-it note, do not put it on the collections. That's bad. On the outside of the box, you can say, I left off at folder five or this pile on the left. And then, you know, initial it, something like that. So you know you can go back and ask that person and see where they actually were. So we've got all this, we've got our plan, our guide, our workflow. Um, as we were talking about in some of the sessions, start out with that collection level finding aid. Um, you can fill in super easy things, um, no matter what system you're in, if you're using collective access, if you're using archive space, if you're using an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and it sounds silly to do something like putting in your repository in an Excel spreadsheet, but yeah, you'll need it eventually if you're able to take that Excel sheet and um, you've talked to Brian and you can upload it or get him to bring it into Connecticut archives online somehow you're going to need that information. So just set it in there, have that as placeholder, it's ready to go. You can hide that field if you don't want to see it all the time. Um, some of the, and this is some of the um, fields that were required fields for any AD finding aid. So you do want to start with the collect, even if at a, at a collection level finding aid, you do want to make sure these are in there. Um, do some research. On your collection, as you're starting to put together your administrative biographical history element or abstract, um, it's all the same thing. It's just called different things in different systems. Um, do some research and get some basic information. However, you know, little asterisk, as mentioned, I think it was the previous session or one of the sessions, um, don't get bogged down in like the little tiny pieces of paper to try to figure out where that came from and what part of it that is and rehome. You can you may find it miraculously down the road. You can have it in the back of your head that that's something that you need to figure out. And it's amazing to me how many times in museum slash library world something will suddenly appear and your eyes will just fall down on your accession register or something someday. And you'll go, oh, my gosh, I was looking for that. That's the thing. That's what I needed to find. It happens more often than you, than you think. Um, but that being said, um, a lot of people have talked about their knowledge of their collection, even though they don't have it in the computer, it's not necessarily written down, but volunteer Vicki, she's the one that knows that collection really well. She's the one to talk to. What happens if volunteer Vicki wants to go to Tahiti and take a vacation? Like you, someone comes in looking at that material, everybody else is standing around going, yeah, I really don't know. So they're the ones too, that, that human knowledge source that you have in your institution talk to them and get them to kind of help or write themselves um, the abstract about what the collection is, where it came from, all the information. They're a super rich resource for everybody. Um, they will also be people that will be extremely important to continue the history of that, um, that collection and let everybody know why it's so important. So they will 
always be a person of value, but having them write this information down, putting it in a computer that's searchable, lets them go on vacation and get away for a little bit. Um, yeah, so this is something that will just help you find things in the collection. This is just our basic record in collective access um, that it comes out and there's more fields that we can display or not display, but all of the summary information that um, history element, the abstract, I can't tell you. So at Fairfield, speaking of my faux librarian part, um, we only have paper finding aids. Those are our source of truth. Um, we are slowly but surely entering them into collective access because Fairfield is in the um, Connecticut Collections Project. We're slowly but surely entering them in, but I don't have anything electronically to search. I have great finding aids to the finding aids um, and things that have like topics that I know which finding aid to go to, which is great, but I still have to pull out the paper version and scroll down. I can't just go through and quickly enter a term. I have some um, Word documents and things like that that have been generated over the years for sharing up on our um, website. And I have gone to our own website to kind of search the finding aids that are up there. Not all of them are still up there. So I'm not always 100% sure that I'm getting all the possible results. Um, and, you know, there's certain things that you know that you're going to be asked for more that you might want to hit first and be able to make them searchable like that. Um, like I think uh, Litchfield folks were talking about the Talmadge papers and that people come and ask for them quite a bit. We get a lot of people in Fairfield asking for Caleb Brewster. So I know his papers and his group. I don't know where he shows up in some other files without really kind of digging more deeply into it. Whereas once I get it all into the computer, it's going to be a lot easier to search um, and a lot easier to kind of get the abstract of what everything is. So this is things to keep in mind, and this is things to keep in mind while you're writing your plan and you're writing your workflow. Um, and this kind of fits into with um, groups that are saying, well, yeah, this is all great. We're, you know, got our finding aids and everything in great, you know, great format. Everything's really set and ready to go. Um, can stuff be more enhanced? Can your records be more enhanced? You've got your basic abstracts done. Um, as you're working on your collections, whether it's to create that ori original abstract or uh, maybe you're doing some rehousing, take some notes on things. Um, don't just like handle the paper and like put it down and sort it. Take some notes about the people's names that you're seeing, about the places that are talked about, um, about the types of subjects they're talking about. Um, this will come in useful later on when you are able to fill out your records more and kind of enhance them and make them um, more ready and able to go up on an EAD finding aid to find those subject headings and find those things that they're talking about. Always take notes, even if it's just a random um, note that you want to put in somewhere that something needs to be rehoused or, or it's in another box or something or it can be moved to another box. I have um, ladies from uh, the DAR from Daughters of American Revolution that come in and do quite a bit of research at our place. And every once in a while, they'll pop up with a note about something They're like, well, you know, this is very important because et cetera. Um, and I will hop into the record, make a quick little note about it. So now I know that that's there and it'll flag me for the future, whether it's something that I wanna add a subject heading to or something that I'm going to need to deal with later on. But they're finding that stuff as they're going through and giving me information back on it, which is super handy because um, they have a lot more knowledge about, they have a lot more knowledge about our records than I do because they've spent time and done the research on it. And that's kind of the way things are with a lot of the volunteers and frequent researchers to collections too. So we've had our plan. We've had our um, idea of how we wanna go through things. We've got our plan, we've got our guide, we've got our workflow. And now look at all these lovely finding aids that we're coming up with. Um, 
varieties of what we've already looked at basically. Um, as we go forward with this, for Connecticut Collections members, um, we're expanding some of the um, abilities in the system to deal with a lot of the finding aids. So there will be um, training sessions on that and how to go through and kind of apply a lot of these things to um, collective access. Um, and for folks that are that are not on the system and doing it on their own too, you know, get in touch with Brian, look at his session again and how um, creating finding aids and get in touch with him about joining the Connecticut Archives Online project. Um, Connecticut collections folks, we will be part of that as well. So you're going to get your collections in your own system, but we're going to put them up on um, Connecticut Archives Online as well. And that workflow will we'll, um, communicate to you as we work it out too and get it going. So kind of what I said before to you could be done, you could um, figure that, you know, because we are dealing with a bunch of different size institutions that are coming to this. We're dealing with folks that are all volunteer. Um, we're dealing with folks that are professional and have professional staff on hand. Um, but this is where you also do want to see where there might be some gaps or things that you could add into your collections. Maybe you add some subject headings in. Um, maybe you have time to create those box lists or inventory lists for things with some of those key names. Um, again, you guys know your area, your institution, your collections. You know what's asked for and what's not. Um, previously at my at my previous institution, there were, you know, some papers that we focused on digitizing first. Those were the ones that we really wanted to get out there because they were so popular and needed to get dealt with that we wanted people to be able to find them, but we also wanted to be able to um, steer them right towards what they wanted specifically rather than um, just hand out to everybody and say, no, no, you need this folder. You don't need all 10 boxes. Let's steer you where you need to go because we know that Friend, you know, Kayla Brewster is in box five. So we know you're going to want to see box five rather than having them have to look through the whole entire collection. Um, just overall with the whole aspect of all of this, um, stick to the basics starting out, follow your collections policy. That's something you can always go back to. If you find a bunch of papers that you're sitting there pulling your hair out, some day going, why am I going through this? What is this doing here? Go back to your collections policy. Maybe they don't need to be there. Um, maybe you don't need to keep them, but that's what's gonna be your guide to go back and figure out how much time something is worth spending on it. Um, follow the fundamentals of the arrangement and description. That's gonna be your key to making everything accessible. And um, I think it was Brian or at least said, you know, be able to talk to all the other systems and all the other things out there. You're gonna have stuff organized where it needs to be. So it's gonna be familiar to pretty much everybody. Um, familiarize yourselves with finding aids and look for those examples to follow. Um, from other institutions and other places. I thought his garden club example was fantastic because I'm pretty sure everybody's got a garden club in town. We've got a couple down here. We have some of their records. Um, I also enjoyed the menu analogy was great too, as my dad also collected menus. I don't think he stole them. I think he actually asked for them, but yeah, I don't know. Um, but you know, you're going to find weird collections of things somewhere else that you're going to be like, oh, okay, this is a great idea on how to do this. Um, and go ahead and use a lot of the stuff that they're doing. It'll help you if you're kind of especially at a sticking point and you don't know how to go about this particular collection that you've gotten. Archivally house and preserve your collections to save them. Um, it may be, you know, in that use your judgment too. Um, you may want to or, um, sleeve every single little photograph as you come across it. Um, I first started working in museums in a graphics collection with prints, drawings, and photographs. And as I was learning more about it, I would open up boxes and not every single photograph was sleeved. And I'm like, oh my gosh, not every single photograph is sleeved. I really need to get this in sleeves. And then I looked up at the hundreds of thousands of photos and be like, okay, no, nope, we're doing this on a sur surface level. We're doing just basic description of what's in this folder and what's in this box. When I get more volunteers and interns, then we can have them start to pick away at stuff. Unless I found something that was in danger um, because it was an acid problem next to a piece of newsprint or something like that. 
use your judgment, but um, always try to err on, on taking best care that you can. Um, I think that was the best piece of advice. You can strive for perfection, but you're not always possible. Do the best you can. Um, and again, there's tons of resources out there for you to be able to um, learn what some of those best practices are. And this is on top of all the excellent resources that we got from everybody too. Um, so there are plenty of resources to go. You just kind of have to poke around and look at all of our resources that we've got too. Um, write your plan, come up with a plan, write out your plan, follow the guide that you're coming up, your in-house policies and rules and um, regulations for yourselves and your cheat sheets um, and create your workflow and make sure your um, staff and everybody's following it. Um, you know, Vicki Volunteer decided she was gonna go to Tahiti but didn't leave off where she was in the collection. Now you can't have Victor Volunteer do any work because he doesn't know where to start. Just stay on top of things and keep the collections, uh, lines of communication open. Rewatch these sessions as much as you need to. Um, and listen to your archivists and ask questions. Um, if you don't understand something, if you got to a point of like, all right, you lost me at this part, ask. We're all here to help. We want to do the best that we can for everybody to um, do the best you can with your collections and make things findable and let people come to your institutions and, and learn some stuff about your collections, your area, and um, help them with what they're looking for. That's pretty much it for me. So anybody has any questions about anything? This is really just super overall basics going back to stuff, so. Diane, thank you so much. This has been, I think you boiled everything down so beautifully <laughs> and kind of really set out a terrific work plan for people to think about as they're digesting all this information over the last five weeks, figuring out next steps. Um, one comment that, that came up several times so far um, in the chat, and if you have any questions, you know, raise your hand, put something in the chat, Emily and I will make sure Diane sees it. But there's been some question about what is collective access? What, what's the difference with Connecticut Archives Online? There's a couple of sources out there, and I think we just need to kind of define what these different online sources are and mm -hmm. when do you use them? Um, I understand confusion with them because it's all a big giant alphabet soup and everything has the word Connecticut in it. So it's really hard to like wrap your head around it. And I almost started off the session and just said, you know, start off with all the alphabets and I'm like, no, I'm not that mean. I'm not going to do that to everybody. <laughs> um, there's different things for different purposes. So what Connecticut, and, and this is an ongoing um, question that everybody has, um, what Connecticut Collections is, is a um, basically consortium project for uh, institutions in the state who need to manage their collections and need a source to do that. If any of you have heard of Past Perfect or um, TMS, the museum system, it's basically the equivalent of those. So we're around to give people a resource for managing their collections. Um, we are using the collective access platform. And I'm trying to use that a little bit more so that people know what we're using because Connecticut Collections isn't the platform, that's the project. Collective access is the platform that we're using. Kind of it's, you know, the it's an equivalent of like archive space or like I said, past perfect. Um, same idea, a way to organize and catalog your collections. Um, Collective access, or not collective access, um, Connecticut Archives Online, um, I like to describe as a finding aid for finding aids. And, you know, Brian can probably come up with a better um, description of it, but you want to be able to use those finding aids, use that table of contents. It's like going to a library card catalog. You need to be able to find something within all those books. So you're going to go to Connecticut Archives Online, and that'll get you into whichever um, finding aid in place that you need to be. So uh, what were the other ones you said, Kathy? Is that all? Um, there's, there's so many things and so many projects going on right now that it's really exciting, but it can be really confusing. Yeah, and no, I think you did a great job. I guess, you know, it, it boils down to um, 
if you're not using Past Perfect or Connecticut Collections or some form of database, then the best place to start is just with an Excel spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And as yeah. you're creating these finding aids, if you don't have a system where you can add, Past Perfect really doesn't work to create a finding aid. It wasn't designed for that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, if you don't have a system that'll allow you to create finding aids, then contact Brian Stevens. He manages Connecticut's archive online and he can walk you through the steps of getting your archives. And like we said, it can be collection level, which is not talking about the Joe Smith wrote Jane Smith, da, 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 da. We're not talking, you know, overview. This is the Garden Club of Brookfield, Connecticut, founded mm -hmm. by in blah, blah, blah. Brian can help you create that footprint. What we're hoping, what we're trying to do in this, helping you get into uh, a database to manage your collections and creating finding aids is we want your collections to be discoverable, as Diane mentioned. In this day and age, researchers will go online first to yes. find the resources that they're going to use in their research projects, their books, whatever their project is, or exhibits, even other curators look online first and foremost. If mm -hmm. you don't have a footprint on the web, nobody knows your collections are there. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of inexpensive and free tools out there. And we just want to kind of help you and your amazing archives be found and be used. And the more people are aware of you, the more that will grow your institution. Money too. More members, more donors. Okay, so we have a question. Please clarify for a Connecticut organization using Past Perfect and looking for help in creating finding aids, who should they contact for help? You want me to do that or you? <laughs> I'm well, either one. I'm just going to say Brian. Yeah, um, it, to be very, very honest, Past Perfect was not made for archive collections. It was made to um, make museum collections, have a database for museum co connections. Brian's contact information is in Google Classroom uh, since he was our presenter yeah. two weeks ago. So if you are looking to create finding aids and have Past Perfect, then talk to Brian and you can use the free templates in Connecticut's archive online to create your finding aid. It'll be accessible to you and accessible to the public. And I'd love to help more with Past Perfect, but I've not used it on a day-to-day -day basis. I've ducked in and out of it, like only enough to know that there's a little button that says like archives or something on it. And that's about it. But I don't know what's available beyond that. So. Yeah, there is actually an archivist in Pennsylvania wrote a 35 page manual on how to use Past Perfect to create a finding aid. The whole point of these is to make it easy. If you if it takes you 35 pages to write a two page finding aid, it's not it's not doable it's, mm -hmm. and it's not a good use of time. We all have uh, not the past perfect manual, but a manual made by someone outside of past perfect to try to make it work for archives. So don't I, I just don't recommend anybody go down that road with past perfect. You can use an Excel spreadsheet much easier. And um, you can use the free templates for Connecticut Archives online. Mm -hmm. Yes, call Brian. Call Brian. Call Brian instead. Okay. Any other questions for Diane? Just going back to see if I missed any questions for you, Diane. Well, you um, answered the paper. One of the questions, questions we so had, uh, because it was, um, you know, you were kind of alluding to this in your talk, is procedure manuals. And um, yeah. so what I'm going to do for that is I will ask our archivists um, if they have some samples they can share and that we will add to the Google Classroom. Procedure manuals are terrific and it always seems to be the last thing people write, but it should be the first thing you write before you actually get deep into processing your collections. And should be the first thing you read. Yes. You don't actually have to read it. They're there to helpful and usually very clear and concise and full of information because there's been many times that people have asked me about something like did you read the manual I made a manual and it's yeah make sure you read it like encourage staff to read it and access put it right out there where people are, are going to see it and be able to find things in it and it, and, it, and really the procedures manuals the notes that Diane was referencing it's all about um sharing the information we all know we're not all going to be at the same place forever 
But even when that time comes and we're not at our institutions or our museums or libraries, someone else is going to take on that work. And it's just a nice thing to do to document how the work has been done, why you use a certain numbering system, mm -hmm. why you store things in a certain place or way. So between the procedures manuals, and as I mentioned earlier, writing those memos to file, whenever you have something confusing, you're not sure, you know, every collection, every gift should have its own accession folder and put those memos in where you can clarify a gift, you can clarify a numbering system. Um, you can say why you chose to save 500 photographs of Mark Twain when they're all the same. Well, there might be a reason you did that. And, you know, so someone doesn't go and say, well, we only need three and they throw out 497 and then find out, oh, we needed those 497. Write Do those you, memos to yes. file. Do you know how many times I've had a question about a collection and gone to the file and found a memo from myself answering that <laughs> question? I'm like, oh, thanks, me. That was very informative. I'm glad I put that in there for myself because I forgot it two years later, like what the original reason for doing something was. Exactly. And like Adrian has put up, don't forget to update. Um, so you, you know, about your best workflow and include tips. So important. How we used to number artifacts when I first entered the field in high school as a volunteer to today, it's changed. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't n number in using the same materials. Materials have improved uh, dramatically so we can um, have less harmful materials doing the permanent numbering. So update that information when procedures change, when information evolves, document that, put that in there. And think of your successors as you go through when you, like I said before, if you, you all go on vacation, you all go somewhere else, you get a whole new changeover of people, make it easier for them to find out why things are being done. Um, when I started here, Adrian knows about the wacky numbering here. Um, I found all the resources of how the numbers were, were done and then kind of did a little overview of all of it. So anybody coming after me hopefully will not um, have to go through the kind of hunting around and finding um, what some of these were because it wasn't in between the break in people, it wasn't stored in a place that I could easily find it. When I did find all the lovely um, notes from Adrian from back in the day about why things were done, I'm like, oh, if I had known this last year, this would have been awesome. But it wasn't left in a place where I could find it. So make sure it's accessible to everybody too. And Sarah's mentioned something that is really fabulous too, that all of this goes towards preserving these materials and collections. The, really, I mean, I think that's why we're all involved in the in museums and libraries and archives in the first place is because we care so much about these materials. So how you make them accessible, how you document them, um, it's all about improving the level of care and access you provide to these collections. So thank you everybody for those really great comments. But yeah, thinking about future users and uh, future managers of these collections too. Um, I've, I've cursed out places when I've gone and can't figure out why something was done some way and know that there's a reason and just wish someone had written that down. So there's a little bit of cursing going on with our finding aids right now in Fairfield. I'm just saying. Yeah. Don't, don't be the person that Diane and I and others will eventually curse out. <laughs> it's my life goal. And yeah, I know documented, some of the, documented. I know some of the former archivists and I love them. And I'm like, it couldn't have been them that did this. It had to have been one of the other ones. Because this that unknown, sense. that unknown archivist or curator who irks us to no end. <laughs> any other questions? Uh, any other questions about the program now that it's wrapping up? Um, can you share examples of numbering systems, strengths and weaknesses of different models starting from scratch? Okay. Um, the slides are not, I can try to get slides from everybody, but the recordings are all available on Classroom and this one will be soon. Okay, so numbering systems, there are, that's like a whole separate talk and I've actually done that talk before. Um, I have a whole other topic about photos too, if we want to do things about photos and archives yeah. too. So, so here's yeah. a very simple way to, to get to numbering system. And I'm going to give you the Litchfield Historical Society method because I think it's the simplest and straightforward. Museum practices, best practices is that you use a three digit number. Okay. And this is for Project. objects part. Yeah. But this also, they use the same system for their archives so that whoever takes it in 
this is how the numbers work for the accession yeah the main accession for the accession yeah. so the first yeah. number is your year so if i i'm going to take in my seltzer bottle and my to-do list this year okay so first year number is the year 2022 second number is the donor let's pretend i'm donor 10 okay have leading zeros because of makes for sorting purposes at litchfield what they do is the papers whether it's one sheet or 5,000 sheets, become a one. And then you number in, in numerical order the objects. So this would become 2022.10.02. My iPhone would be 03 and up and up and up. So the way Litchfield does it, since so many historical societies get archives and objects together, the very first number will be archive and one number for an entire collection. We do not break out and number archives separately. Um, and I'm just rolling up because I think there were a couple more questions. Do, 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 do. So that's, and, and there are some really good sources out there about registration materials and registration techniques. We can see what we can find to share with all of you. Uh, and we will try to see if there are more slides we can share. Thank you, Adrian. Um, Emily is putting up the link. Do not forget that uh, this Friday is due the Connecticut Humanities Operating Support Grant. It's free money, guys, free money. I mean, it's a, a straightforward grant, no match is required. This is the state legislature saying, we wanna help you and go forward. Oh, Kathy included, why include the donor? Well, who gives you the material is as important as the gift itself. And it helps you track how many donations you get in the year. Um, so we always, that is that is mu museum best practices for registration. We always create a donor number for each gift. Otherwise it looks like it's one huge gift. So always have that donor number. Um, yes, I will type a sample in the chat right now. So 2022.010.01. You don't like my example? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 2022.010.02.03. Oh, I did 02 again. And uh, yes, I looked at it. Cup, it's 04 A and B. We might have to do a. And uh, what Ann said in the chat, it's more of a, the second number is more of a donation number of, how, of what donation it was for the year rather than a number assigned to a specific person. Right, because if that person comes Thanks, in later yeah. in the year, they get the next number in the system. Yes, thank you for yeah. pointing that out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you want to have that number. And honestly, as a curator, there are certain places where I work where I remember that that year and that donor donation number means a certain gift. You start knowing these numbers and like you see yep. something like, oh, that's part of the Rosenthal gift. You know, I know that 1996.32 is the Rosenthal's. I didn't know that was a piece of the Rosenthal donation. It make, it matters, just like we were talking content and context for archives, also works for museum uh, objects as well. Uh, what if you don't know the year or the donor? Well, what you're dealing with then at that point is a found in collection item. And then um, if you don't have this is the system you use as things are coming in and you've documented the gifts and doing data gifts. If you don't know the donor, then you do found a collection and we typically process those. The number, the year number will be the year you actually process the found in collection. So Wendy, if, if yesterday you found that mummy hand <laughs> that you were mentioning the last week, then this is the year you give it an accession number, you know, 2022. But in your processing, you mentioned that it was found in collection, that you, in 2022, no documentation had been found. By 2026, somebody might find it and update it. And I but, usually use the same number for found in collections for the year, because you're figuring you don't know anything about it. So if I look and see that 2022.10 is my found in collections number, I know looking at that thing, it was a found in collections. And then I can add on if I need to. Uh, we use the year it is accession. Yes, um, that's that's typical practice and best practice. Um, all right. If there isn't anything Don't use else, X numbers. 
X numbers are only for inventorying purposes. Those are, X means usually yeah. refers to temporary. So try not to use- Don't alphabet. use X numbers for actual yeah. accession things. Yeah, not for actual accession. But remember this, if your numbering system doesn't match what I've put up, but it has a number, that works. The whole point is for things to have a number associated that takes us to documentation. So you may not like your numbering system, but if it has a number, use it. If you want to change it to museum standard practice, which is the three-part number, you can write a memo and put in your procedures manual and say from 2023 on, we use a three-part numbering system. But if it's got a number, just use it. It still works. As long mm -hmm. as it's documented somewhere, you have a number and you have documentation, you can find it. And that's always what we're, we're trying to get to um, is know where these things are and what they are. Things without numbers are the bane of our existence. So, Diane, thank you so very, very much um, for a terrific presentation, a terrific wrap up and end to our five part course on Archives 101. We've loved having all of you and getting all of your feedback uh, during this uh, series. We're very grateful to NHPRC, the National Historical Records and Publications Commission for funding this program. Um, there are more programs to come in the, over the next two years. Uh, we do have some programs just for Connecticut Collections members coming up. And there are projects that I'm doing with our State Historical Records Advisory Board that of course focus on archives that are also coming up. So keep following the league, follow Conservation Connections website and Connecticut Humanities. Uh, thank you to Emily who does all of the huge behind the scenes stuff for us. I'm so very grateful. Hoping Amaris gets well very soon and email us. You can use the classroom. Our emails are there. The all the teachers are listed under people. You can contact them there. You can contact one another through the people section of Google Classroom. And we thank you very much for being with us. Good luck and be well.